Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this um, and the second uh, chat from African American Studies by one of our wonderful scholars, Alyssa, Dr. Alyssa Collins. Um, we are so happy to have you here today, really. Alyssa Collins is Assistant Director of, of uh, Professor, Assistant Director, I'm Assistant Director. Hi, I'm Nancy Tolson, and I'm the Assistant Director of African American Studies. Alyssa is the Assistant Professor in English and African American Studies here at the University of South Carolina. Presently, she is doing a year-long um, fellowship, oh my gosh, at uh, and she is the Octavia E. Butler Fellow um, he, um, in Huntington Library Art Museum and Botanical Gardens in California. And we've missed her. Uh, and we're so looking forward to hearing every word that you're going to spew out your mouth today. So um, take it away. Now you will hear Dr. Alyssa Collins. Good morning, or I guess uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's morning where I am, but let me just get set up really fast with my slides. Um, start. All right, so um, good morning. As uh, Dr. Hilson said, I am a Dr. Alyssa Collins. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you today. It's been a while since um, I have spoken with you and I'm seeing your faces, so I miss you. Um, but I'm glad to be here for the faculty conversation series. I thought I would spend some of my time today um, telling you a little bit about my project, um, uh, talking to you about what I've been working on this year um, as I've been on research leave as the Octavia E. Butler Fellow and um, just kind of showing you some cool things that I've noticed. So uh, yeah, I'll start by telling you a little bit about Butler um, and then a little bit about the library archive, a little tiny bit about my book project, and then we'll kind of talk about the things that I have noticed and seen that have made me kind of start to consider or kind of reaffirmed my decision to consider Butler, not only as a writer, but as a researcher and theorist as well. So, Octavia E. Butler, born in 1947 in Pasadena, California. Um, she knew that she wanted to be a writer from a very young age, and um, that determination really comes through in a lot of her early diaries and notes um, to herself. I always like to throw this in, but the E um, in her middle name, her middle name is really important. Her middle name is Estelle, and um, it was really important to her because her mother is also Octavia. And so Butler is called Estelle as a child and among her family for like a really long time. It's also a really nice connection because Estelle means star. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of importance in the E. So if you're writing about her, like don't drop the E. Um, even though it was dropped in my title by accident. So um, she's an author of science fiction. And while she's known for writing science fiction and taking this kind of planetary approach, being in her archive has really kind of uh, convinced me of the importance of the local in her work, of Pasadena as a place where a lot of her work actually is set, um, or in like the greater LA County, but also as Pasadena as a place um, of scientific discourse and inquiry. And, and Butler is very aware of the publicized science and technological developments that are going on in places like Caltech, at JPL, and organizations like the Planetary Society. So I like to, it's, it seems like Pasadena is very random, a very important place for both her thinking and the kind of arguments that I'm going to make about her um, investments in scientific discourse. Um, as you can see, she was um, awarded top awards for craft, both the Hugo and the Nebula, and was the first science fiction author to win the MacArthur. And I've just included some themes here. Many people read Butler and teach Butler for different reasons, but some themes that always kind of stick out to me is her attention to the state of humanity or humanities, her interest in encounter and embodiment, um, relationship and kinship, um, including kind of symbiosis, um, her uh, interest in pushing against gender and power and thinking about apocalypse and also evolution. Um, I've also included a quick kind of dirty bibliography for you. Um, she wrote science fiction and she writes about this a lot in her notes and talks about this a lot 
Um, she wrote science fiction because she enjoyed the kind of possibilities of a genre that alienates and defamiliarizes um, us from problems and offers us a way to imagine um, different kinds of problems, societal problems to their logical ends. So for instance, Butler might ask what would happen if Reagan's winnable nuclear war came to pass or to both the Xenogenesis trilogy, um, the Xenogenesis trilogy or Lilith's Brood, and the second to the Earth Seed duology, like the collapse of society. Um, I've also placed a fun asterisk next to um, Kindred because Butler notes in her archive in a couple of speeches that she gives that this is her only work of fantasy. Um, so across all of her work, she's kind of isolated this text, which is arguably maybe one of her most popular or uh, most read texts as something that is generically different from her other works. So the Octavia E. Butler archive is located at the Huntington Library and Gardens, which is located in San Marino, which is like a neighborhood right next to Pasadena. It's a private library that's um, based on the collection of Henry Huntington, who was a railroad, a railroad magnet and collector. And the story of the acquisition um, is that Butler was approached by librarians after she was invited to give a talk um, at the library, and she decided to leave her papers with the library about a year later. The collection was processed from 2009 to 2013, and uh, with additional information added in 2017. And the housing of her papers here, kind of in this really private, beautiful space, kind of naturally generates a very interesting conversation about conservation, about access, and about approach, like who gets to engage with these works, what uh, communities do. And I think that the library, this is something the library is grappling with. And part of this grappling um, was the development of the Butler Fellowship that I have right now, which was developed um, with the Butler estate, so with her family's um, interest as well. The archive um, that holds Butler's um, papers, all of her working papers, um, including manuscripts and drafts, correspondences, photographs, research files, and a small collection of books. Um, for my project, the one I'm about to tell you about in a second, I spend a really good amount of time in the research notes and ephemera. And these are all kind of her working notes that she used to draft her novels. And so um, those are the places that I stick around. But if you're really interested in a kind of thoughtful and beautiful representation of what Butler's archive is like, you might check out um, A Handful of Earth, A Handful of Sky by Lin Linnell George, which is kind of this beautiful representation uh, and thought, um, kind of thought provoking invocation of Butler as a creator and what her archive kind of helps us see about her as a writer. Um, so the reason I have been in doing research is that I'm working on my book manuscript, Cellular Blackness, Octavia Butler's Posthuman Ontologies. And uh, Cellular Blackness constellates turn of the century black speculative writing by women that contest, expand, and redefine what it means to be human. So that question about humanity. Um, the authors that I work with shift the scope of the human and provide new bodily ontologies based on or related to real scientific narratives of the past and present. And the authors that I'm working with um, include Butler, um, obviously, um, Nadia Korfor, who's a contemporary um, African futurist, um, Munari Kayu, also an African futurist, Audre Lorde, and N.K. Jemison. Um, and so Cellular Blackness takes its name from a term that I've coined, Black Femme Cellularity, that um, tracks and describes the type of human and post-human alterations represented by these writers. So in these texts, we get a lot of different kinds of bodies, a lot of altered bodies. Um, if you've read any Butler, you might think about Lilith in Xenogenesis, we might think about um, Anyamu who can um, manipulate her cells. So Black fem femcellularity for me is a frame for imagining and investigating alternate ways of being human that's based on shifting the scope of humanity from um, embodiment and flesh to something that's smaller and replicates often cells. Um, and, it, and in this attention to cells, we can kind of reveal and unpack different ontological paradigms um, around embodiment, 
around gender, reproduction, family and kinship structures, and our own kind of species relationship to environment and our relationship to generating technology. So that kind of leans into the post-human conversations of the post-human cyborg. And the methodology of this project, it's important to talk about this because this is how I ended up in the archive, um, is through three types of reading, archival, close reading of publish, uh, published novels and distant reading of digital archives. And Butler's research and what I found in the archive, what I suspected to find in the archive really helped um, and structures the theoretical anchor for this project, Black Femme Cellularity, and also posits Butler as a writer, researcher, and theorist. And this methodology kind of came out of questions that I had about cancer when I first read Dawn, um, Butler's Dawn, in which the protagonist Lilith is kind of selected by these aliens for her, for what they call her quote unquote talent for cancer. And this description very much reminded me of a discourse around Henrietta Lacks and her stolen immortalized cell line. It also made me wonder how much, uh, what Butler knew about Lacks and how much she was directly engaging with the contemporary science discourse of her time. So off to the archive I went at that point, at this point I was a um, doctoral student. And in 2017, I spent a month of my summer in her archive. And I ended up finding notes like these that both evidence that Butler was actively referencing Henry Lacks and HeLa cells as she talked about cancer. And furthermore, that she was theorizing these cells in a very particular way. And so the ways we can see both her engagement with Henry with Lacks is on this first um, left, on the left side, this index card, um, where she's writing um, a speech about her inspirations. Um, that kind of brought about the Xenogenesis trilogy, also known as Lilith's Brood. And she has a list of things, right? She's thinking about socio socio sociobiology, genetic engineering, and cancer, specifically um, HeLa. And right, you can see, or I hope you can see, that there's um, a little bit, a little note to herself reminding her to talk about who Henrietta Lacks is, giving a brief biography, um, and then a little citation of where this biography is from. And what is kind of most interesting to me, you might notice at the top attached to, oh, attached to cancer, right, is are the words immortality and regeneration. Um, and so this, this is initially really interesting to me, coupled with this note that I have over here that is um, from one of Butler's commonplace books, um, which are just little books that she kind of kept around that, uh, had have all kinds of information in them. So they might have um, they might have shopping lists and notes to herself, but also research notes in them as well. Um, and this is the first place that I initially saw Butler talk about uh, Henry and Alex HeLa cells. Um, and this is a bit of her theorizing, right? Saying that HeLa cells as opening the apparent possibility that a, can uh, that a cancer that confers immortality and death may also confer immortality instead of death. So this is kind of the, that, the kind of thinking that gets me excited, uh, theorizing of what this cancer is, right? We know what cancer is. We know the history of Henrietta Lacks. We know that cancer is kind of this replicating thing that is growth that um, kills, but also like what are the possibilities to imagine um, this kind of replication? Um, outside of its kind of con uh, contemporary limits of death. And so this got me really interested in what else Butler was researching, what other kinds of scientific discourses that she is engaging in. So I did, so I came back to do even more digging. So once you consider Butler is not simply a writer, a great one, um, but also as a researcher, um, she gives us a lot to consider about her own engagement with research and her insistence on both kind of being up to date with contemporary and journalistic discourses around science and other topics. And I will say that Butler um, is pretty, uh, her interests are pretty extensive. I tend to um, stick to science and technology because one, because of science fiction and two, it's because of what I'm quite interested in, but she does kind of cover other topics in the same way that I'm going to show you now. So here's some kind of residues from her research and collecting life. Um, in the first image, you will also, you can see a note card that she, generate, she generated as part of a talk um, that she was giving in aspiring writers. Um, right, and it's a 
a suggestion or a call to um, do research and remember to do research. And both we kind of can understand this as her telling writers, but also um, reminding herself, right, to avoid big embarrassing errors and to avoid accidentally rewriting stories that they already know. So we see, so Butler writes this to herself a couple of times. Um, this gets iterated a bunch of times across the archive. Um, in the second image, we can see some useful books. Butler had strong feelings about how research should be, how her research or how writers' research should be approached. Um, so she gives concrete examples to her listeners, um, including using kind of specialized dictionaries. Um, in the archive, there's a list um, of larger archives that she might try. She was very interested and invested in travel um, for research as well. And then the third image is something that um, really excited me. It's one of my favorites. Uh, it comes from a collection of call slips that Butler kept from her research at the LA Public Library as she was researching Kindred and Wild Seed kind of simultaneously. Um, this is really cool because it's in a pile of index cards that Butler is also keeping her bibliography. So as a scholar, you can kind of, we can kind of see both her interest in research, but also what she was researching and using, what books that she decided to buy and purchase, those kinds of things. And also sometimes she gives little notes about what she thought of the books. Um, it's very funny. Um, but this one is really cool because uh, this is a call from the Federal Writers Project. Um, and we can kind of imagine what kinds of narratives of um, the formerly enslaved that she's um, investigating. So in addition to books, Butler was a self-proclaimed news junkie and her research practices involved clipping articles from papers, especially the LA Times, which is kind of her local paper, some other national papers like the New York Times, local newsletters, and she used to receive kind of newsletters from the Planetary Society and NASA um, to keep up with what, um, you know, what's new in the world of space. So here in this picture, we can see sort of what might be an average Butler annotation. She doesn't annotate all of her clippings, but a lot of them. Um, and she kind of, you can see her indicating importance or things of note in this, um, in this article and using kind of uh, little tiny annotations at the top to explain um, what she's reading or reiterate. Um, and sometimes she also uses these marginal spaces um, to make connections across um, articles or to kind of pot, like think, think through things um, as well. So we can both think through Butler, using these clippings, we can both think through Butler and how she's engaging um, scientific discourse, but we can also get a quite extensive, extensive um, archive of late 20th century popular scientific discourse, like what is going on in science, medicine, and technology. You want to know in the 1980s, um, Butler probably kept it. Um, so that's pretty cool as well. Um, and through her bibliography, her clippings, annotations, um, and the way we organize, she organized these pieces, we can get a pretty accurate understanding of Butler's research interests and start to trace these discourses through her writing. So on the left, I've included a manila envelope. Butler kept all of her clippings in these envelopes and like kind of tightly organized. So well organized, but this is the organizing structure of uh, her research notes in the archive. Um, and so on each envelope, she would organize all of these clippings under a theme, include a date, um, the closing date of the envelope, which is kind of the last day, um, the last date of the, the latest article. She would include all of the all of the articles on the front of the envelope. And she annotated these titles, perhaps indicating what she thinks is most important to reference or certain keywords. Um, so here you can see that this is kind of um, a envelope full of biomedical stuff that is also kind of uh, attached to med medicine and physical health. It's the sixth, it's the sixth one in this series. Um, also on this slide, I've incorporated or I've included some um, contemporary science discourses of Butler's time um, that Butler researched and that I would argue are actively at work in her novels. Um, 
my interest in connecting Butler with these discourses and also the other authors in my project is not to suggest that Butler's working or thinking is particularly indebted to these discussions or to argue that science fiction as it relates to science fact is somehow more important. But instead, I'm interested in the kind of co-evolution and co-constitution of these ideas, what we might understand from Butler's own mingling of science discourse and the imaginative and her practice of imaginatively theorizing um, through um, the writing of science fiction. So that brings me to kind of our, my last push as, so if we're going to think about Butler as a writer, a really great one, we can think about Butler as a researcher, um, a really extensive one. And we can also think about Butler as a theorist. Um, her practice of meticulous research and engagement with scientific discourse, coupled with her project of writing, really reveals her works to always be theorizing. It allows the novel that she writes to theorize actively and provide new ontologies for human, for human being in the 21st century. So on this, car, um, on this slide, I've included two cards. They're part of a series of seven cards um, in which we kind of can really see this theorizing going forth. So here Butler is thinking through her novel, God of Clay, which doesn't actually ever come into being. Uh, she kind of piecemeals and takes it apart and makes uh, into God of Clay into the parable of the sower and parable of the talents. Um, but here she's trying to um, think through what an, uh, a human colony on another planet um, might be or act like. And taking this kind of culture, these cultural forces of a human space colony and um, thinking through their actions as biological entities. So on the left, you can see her thinking through um, the colony, if it acted like bacteria. And on the right, you can see her thinking through the colony as if it acted like a malignant cancer. Like how, how, is, how will these people act? If it's bacteria, maybe they'll be, you know, more symbiotic, right? They'll um, maintain their, their um, integrity as a colony and work beside um, whoever or whatever land is there, whoever is there on the planet. Um, they might be parasitic, but they won't fully integrate. Um, if we think through the kind of human uh, space colony as malignant cancer, it's pretty much destruction and um, for you know any reason, um, and um, <laughs> it's pretty much destruction um, and replacement. So in this, right, I, I love this kind of work because it shows her brilliance and it shows the way that she translates these discourses that seem really separate into a um, into one kind of narrative. Um, she doesn't choose either of these. I think God, God of Clay ends up being a <laughs> like sperm, <laughs> a sperm cell. Um, and they end up being like a father world of some sort, but we don't really know what happens because the, the novel never came to be. But um, I love these um, cards because as a writer um, and as a reader of Butler's work, we could maybe call her books a little bit coy. She often leans into ambiguity and ambivalence in a way to really get readers to think on their own and like press into difficult questions. But as a theorist and researcher, she's quite explicit. Um, and this is why I love working on this project so much, right? It is um, very clear that Butler is not only, you know, speaking to her scientific peer, science, science fiction peers, but also to science and science, her scientific discourses that she's actively metabolizing. And that in these moments of co-constitution, we can kind of see a broader or fuller possibilities of both discourses at once. Um, and Butler starts to really push the theoretical and push science discourse, allowing us to think through different possibilities and ways of being, right? And this kind of allows me as a fangirl to not only know her brilliance, but to see it again in a different and, more, and magical way. And so that's really all I have for you today. Um, I just wanted to show you some cool stuff um, that I thought was cool. And I really appreciate uh, your time. Thanks. Thank you, Alyssa. This was wonderful. You know why? Because I'm one of those 
fans just like you of Octavia Butler. I mean, I started reading her um, when I was in um, undergrad and she was still alive. And when I got to grad school, I had the, the pleasure of meeting her. Um, she came to University of Iowa and we had a reception and because we were the grad students and we had to sit in the kitchen, <laughs> um, she came and sat in the kitchen with us for a while and talked. And it was just so magical, you know, cause we were all like, ooh, ooh, Octavia Butler, right? Yes. And uh, it, was, it was delightful. Um, and to now see the other side, I, I don't know. I, I guess I would just be giddy all the time, you know, um, you know, being it and seeing her words and seeing the two sides of the way she thought about things. I mean, I thought that last card, those last two cards were just great. Um, you know, just so fantastic. Um, so let me ask you, what was one of the first things you actually did when you first got there? I mean, and, and how long did it take for the security to come and take you out of the, the archives? The first thing I did when I got there was I, I had really actually been struggling with this for a while since I've been writing on her, but I read, I read Survivor. It feels like I, it felt like I wasn't supposed to read it, but because she didn't like it. So she, yeah. she, she just liked it so much. Um, but I had a feeling that it would kind of be important to my work. And it is, it's a, it ends up being um, a book about a human colony trying to say like keep humanity and I was like oh this is really important to what I'm working on but if I, it did feel like a little bit of a betrayal right right yeah um I don't know I, I would be living there you know they just know me by oh she's taking a shower in the bathroom again <laughs> you know um but uh, I want to say that people have really, they really appreciated your, your lecture. They're saying, I'm so glad you included pictures, which I really am, um, along with all of her notes and, and, and saying, I love getting a peek at her process. And it really says something about um, her as a writer, uh, uh, intellect, uh, she was just brilliant. I mean, just all the way around, um, looking at that, my one of my favorite books, you know, you, you mentioned Kindred, okay, I'm going to throw that on the side, because Kindred for years, and I do mean like decades, Kindred was never the same size as her other books. It was always a little bit bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And it was not the, 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 the paperback size, it was always a bigger size. And it's just been in recent times that it was change to be the same and Kendra was always a little more expensive um and I always found that to be kind of fascinating even though you know you sacrifice to give gifts right um but another one was what well, Kendra being special my my favorite in the world and I've taught it several 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 times is Wild Seed and when you started talking about the the idea of the cellular um and the people read the women um, generating outside because of course they've always been able to do it inside creation, right? But to do it outside like Anyanyu, um, you know, I thought that that was just very good. Um, what is your favorite book, can I ask? Oh, my favorite book? I know, book. that's a slap, that's right? Really How hard. dare you? I mean, I, I, recently reread Wild Seed and I've been working on a chapter that is about Wild okay. Seed and just like and you know Emma is like the cool the coolest like I don't really um I always forget it's just it's it's next level I feel like uh it's interesting because this project starts with Lilith yes. but Lilith almost feels like a step back from mm -hmm. like how cool um Anya is in Wild Seed how she's like, I'm going to be a dolphin for a bunch of years. Let me nibble. Let me, let me nibble I'm on the dolphin. I'm going to eat a dolphin and become a dolphin. There you go. Um, you can't control my body. Only I can. Right. Like all of this stuff. Um, that's women's so cool. rights, Re women's reproductive rights. I mean, I think I mean, we, 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 we
there's transness, like there's so much. And it always, for me, it always comes back to this manipulation and replication of cells that gives us like an out for embodiment. It gives us a different way to think about reproduction and propagation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's really super exciting for me. And um, yeah. also I, you know, biology nerd. <laughs> and I think that Butler is also like a biology nerd too. Yeah, so I feels, believe that. Yeah. yeah, so let me ask the, 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 the main question, and I guess the foundational question is, how did you find Octavia Butler? I mean, you know, I mean, when I was doing it, you weren't even born, you know, when I was reading Octavia Butler, and I have to say it like that, but um, I mean, I remember, I have the, the, the Dawn and all of those, when they were not putting out black covers, you have so those. these were white women. Can I see that? Like next time, can I see it'll them? cost you. Yes, but you can see them. But yeah, I've, never, I've only seen the proofs. I've never seen them oh, like no. physically. No, I have all of those. I have all of ah. those, and they're all these white women because at that time they didn't want people to know who Octavia Butler was, and so you know they were eating up these sci-fi books with these white women on them, and that was selling. But let me ask how. Let go back to the real question: Is how did you get into Octavia Butler? I actually came to her quite late. It wasn't until grad school. I loved science fiction growing up, but I stopped reading it maybe in high, in high school and college because I wanted to be into serious literature. And, you know, I got it. No one told me that. I just got I, know. <laughs> I think you're supposed to be um, adult. And oh, wow. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, I was... And this got kind of knocked out of me after I graduated. I was friends with a bunch of um, people who worked in publishing and they're like, you like science fiction. Like, why aren't you reading all this good science fiction? But anyway, so by the time I got to grad school, I was taking a feminist literature course, I think with Susan Freeman. And uh, she, we read Parable of the Sower and had a lot of conversations about different kinds of genre literature, mm -hmm. um, including romance. And so the kinds of... <laughs> scholarly arguments about romance and science fiction mm -hmm. um, are problematic to me. And I think it's less, you know, they're less argument, argumentative about, you know, readers being dupes or um, mm -hmm. I think as Ralph Ellison said, like science fiction being juvenilia, like he yeah. you know, it's that in his like 1995 in, uh, article about Invisible Man. He's like, I didn't want to write it because it's juvenilia. Wow. Um, so that kind of not only Butler's like <laughs> really crazy writing, um, I read Parable of the Sower and I was like, well, where's the weird stuff? Because I was like, I heard she's a science fiction author. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, where are the aliens? And so I ended up reading Blood Child and I was hooked. I was like, wow. okay, this is, she's really weird and I really yeah. appreciate this. Right. And then just kind of went from there. Okay. Okay. Wow. So you got her through women's studies. I did. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's a great way to, to, to actually be introduced to her. I mean, we could go on and on and actually in regards to women's rights, um, especially the body uh, through Octavia Butler's work. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, let me see what else <laughs> going there. So tell me about Kindred, because when you said Kindred, I've heard this before about Kindred being a fantasy and I, I grapple with that myself. Um, you know, being a fantasy, but where else would we put it, even though it's time travel? Um, how do you see it? Yeah, there's something that just feels, for me, has always felt incredibly, like, stripped. It feels different. <laughs> like, it's a different, it is. It's yeah. a different vibe. Mm -hmm. she has, and I, it's, for me, like, when I read this in, when I read this kind of note that she had like offhandedly put in one of her talks and that she was like, ah, oh, kindred, a fantasy. Like it's, it's basically, I guess maybe the most sci-fi is that she's thinking about it as like a travel to a different planet. Like how would we uh, explain, how would we explain um, the antebellum South if like you were a traveler, right? Okay. okay. Um, and that for her is like a fantasy novel. Mm -hmm. um, but it just feels different. And I was trying to figure out if we're, if for me, like I'm interested in the cellular and she's really kind of building this momentum of like genetics and cellularity through like 
five, six books, right? Right, right. Um, and I was like, well, where, where does this fit? Um, so I was like, oh, it's a fantasy. That makes, like, she's thinking about this as a difference of genre. And that's why everything kind of gets stripped back. It feels, it doesn't, it's not the same. That's probably why the trim size is different, right? To indicate that yeah. to you as well, right? That mm-hmm. this isn't, like, science fiction needs to be mass markets only. It's not the right. same anymore. Exactly. But, so, right, so maybe these are all kinds of various indications where kindred is different. Um, yeah. And, and also, you, you think maybe the fantasy is, I wish I could go back to slavery. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's that, that side fantasy of, if I went back in slavery, this is what I would do. But then she has to grapple with the fact that it's not going back in slavery, but making sure not to mess it up so that she really doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. yeah so. it's and it's also interesting to me to think about her using the same like research and the same kind of headspace to write wild seed too ah. if those hang at the same they're they're they're, they're right hanging here. at the same time like yes, they the are. same time period mm-hmm. but it's completely different because Seriously. I was like, i'm gonna have a you know plantation and i'm just gonna become a white man for a minute right i can or, make my or, body that you or, know, you know Oh, all of that but that to me is more fantasy wild seed and that whole um series clay's arc and all of those that's more of a, a to me a fantasy because we go through um you know slavery we take it all the way up and we move through time in those um and those are our fantasies too You know, what if I was a white man? How would I, you know, you know, I I own a plantation, but everybody on here, it's all good. You know, Yeah, I think that's like interesting to think about, like the kind of generic, the genre rub, right? Like, Mm -hmm. so if, if Butler is talking about fantasy, I think for, for that note card, she's, she's writing to a bunch of like writers who are interested in writing science fiction. Mm -hmm. She's thinking about the specific, like generic um tropes of fantasy yes like what can we do with fantasy versus what we can do with science fiction Mm -hmm. and so like you get like a pattern of series but it's all kind of based in this like psionic research that she had been doing for like ages she's really (laughs) there's a lot of (laughs) there's a lot of um interesting uh scientific discourse that um had has since been thrown out or was also kind of marginal but she's like what if we were telepaths like who right are doctors are talking about telepaths mm-hmm. what do we know about genetics right um and you know, actually talks about cells in mm-hmm. wild seed mm-hmm. um an abomination of milk yeah right remember so, that um, whole thing she goes off with about an abomination you know this mm-hmm. is an abomination and there's just no way she should be um you know people should be drinking such a thing you know but I always in in class I would always say that she is her own science lab you know her body because remember she would just take a nibble or something to go, mm, uh, uh, no it ain't gonna work yeah mm-hmm. I mean what I love about that is that I've been writing about um Butler's interest in the Gaia hypothesis and in cybernetics mm. and she doesn't fully get into this she's she's really thinking about this for like God of Clay, Parable of the Sower, those kinds of things before mm-hmm. she before she starts writing I think in like she writes uh, 1989 maybe she writes to her um, agent and she's like I have this Gaia novel it's going to be great and um, <laughs> and it then not come to pass but we can think about the ways that there are scientific narratives about connection about systems about like things being together and homeostatic principles wow. and and you know, was like doing homeostasis like on her own body right right like, right lab. she knows exactly she knows exactly and specifically what needs to be regulated mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. to keep her healthy right. and so I was like and, oh, yeah, others and others too and Mm -hmm. like that's a problem for her right when she can't convince like someone else's body to do the thing that her body can do her body can do right there are limits to that and so it's really interesting to me because a lot of times I will find or a couple of times I will find her being interested specifically in something but kind of can follow her in a specific kind of like argument, scientific argument, and but can follow her thinking. And I was like, oh, but you are already kind of thinking this and doing this um, in your published work already. already. And that's why you like this because mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. like works. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Hey, Dina wants to know, she wants your, your, um, 
your thoughts on fledgling and and thank you Dina cuz I forgot about fledging cuz I could try to kind of not think about it but um she wants to know your thoughts on fledgling yeah i'm mean, fledgling also kind of works in this i'm not i haven't written about it yet so i i don't want to i haven't thought about fledgling like really hard but um it's the one that everyone is like wait are you going to write about it um, All right. so i will dino will talk about it <laughs> But I'll be, it does work. I'll be it on that conversation. Too. Yeah, we can talk about it, right? It does work to um, a kind of consumption and adjustment of bodies. Um, mm -hmm. That is, I don't know. It's always cool. She's always doing it. It's like, what? Yeah, yeah. But, but another thing to me is one of her themes is destiny. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, where are you going? Um, how, you know, or how do we survive too? And, and that, I think that's another one is survival. And mm -hmm. I, um, I think of so many of these women as survivors, mm -hmm. even though, you know, she writes about survivor, but, you know, these women are survivors, you know, um, or, and this is another, I, I've got so many things right now, no? uh, uh, uh. but um, also coming to age. And that's why I do Wild Seed because it's coming to age because what is the age of transition? Yeah, I mean. It's 13. Right, it is 13. and it's about thirteen, and either you die or you don't. Die or you don't. Yeah, right? I mean, there's so much. I feel like I live my life right writing about pattern is trying to avoid writing about Doro because I really dislike Doro, but do it's really interesting because in in Butler's notes she writes about like the part of herself that is Doro, Ooh. which is like controlling um like generative um mm -hmm. and scary um and these are the patternist characters especially doro and Anyo, are the ones that stick around for a really long time totally. in high school she's writing about psionics mm -hmm. and like this kind of breeding program so she's those are characters that like were with her yeah um but yeah, I think about the way I think about Butler and Destiny often or survival is through a kind of um, thinking, her thinking through evolution a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I, <laughs> this is my own personal suspicion, a suspicion that I am willing to stake my career on apparently. Okay. But her it <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> just kidding. But um, her interest and her difficulties with successfully getting humans off of earth like in a mm -hmm. in a good way right mm -hmm. um she does it in survivor and she's like that wasn't the way like let's actually stop printing this right she does it in um lilith's brood but they're always supposed to go back right but and the, and the moon colony doesn't really work the mars colony doesn't work um and she's trying to do it in the earth seed duology and she does but she can't write anymore she gets writer's block and there's that mantra in Earthseed about um, like a childhood on Earth, adolescence in the stars. Mm -hmm. And that coupled with the Umkali being like, hey, we just gene trade and one day we'll meet each, we'll meet our like siblings and not recognize them. Right, I really right. think Butler, and I really think that for Butler, like leaving Earth, it was like an evolutionary, pro is an evolutionary process that for humans, like it would actually change who humans are fundamentally to like leave earth. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's, that's another place, right? Like what might we think of as destiny? Is it to like stop being human as we know it? I mean, mm. it possibly be, that's what happens in Xenogenesis. Yes. Or is it, you know, something else, right? Like humans can't stay the way they are and leave and be in the stars at the same time. Right. And, right. and perhaps maybe um, if Butler had lived longer or had thought through that, I think she might have gotten there. There seems to be evidence or indication that that's right. a thing that's brewing um, there. She would have given us the answer. She might have, yeah. Yeah, and I believe, but, but you know, I also believe, you know, that coming of age theme, theme that she has, you know, cause you, the transition, you know, you find out what your ability is around 13 or 14, you know what I'm saying? And if you are guided the right way, you survive, right? But I think of that as being part of adolescence and, and childhood is the earth part. Mm -hmm. 
And then you're going into this uncharted territory once you get 13, especially if you survive. Mm, yeah. You know what I'm saying? If, if you survive it, then you're going into uncharted territories, especially if we're dealing with Dora because, you know, he can smell you out and know that you're there, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, it's, he's a chill and he's, you know, I read these books and I've read them over and over and over. And I, you know, it's one of those things you, you, your feelings get into it and you know, you hate him, but you, he's there, you know, and this is what she fears. Sometimes she can, you know, he cannot sense her because what is she a bird by this time, you know, mm -hmm. or something else that he's not able to. So I'm really thinking that this is that chartered territory that she makes, um, makes going off of earth part of adolescence yeah you know yeah it's it that is it's safe the learning. children are safe the children are safe but they can't be with the adults like ever <laughs> like <laughs> it's it's really strange right like right a good way to think about it i re yeah. was reading them the first time i read them i was feeling pretty what was i I, don't, I was feeling kind of contrarian, so I didn't read them in the order, in their chronological order. I read mm. them in the order that she had published them because okay. I wanted to just, like, know. I was like, well, this came first. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And so you start really nicely. I mean, not nicely, but, like, Patternist is, Pattern Master is a weird book. Yeah. Um, it's actually, like, the third, the third Butler book I read. I was like, well, I want to read her first book. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I read Parable, Blood Child, then Patternist. Pattern master. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, yeah. On an afternoon. Cause uh, so you were all, you were a little bit confused. Did you take uh, therapy after that? Yeah. No, I mean, I was like, this is interesting. <laughs> yeah. And it does feel like very um, kind of constructed science fiction, right? You're like in a completely different world. Right. Um, but thinking about like adolescence and what it is, mm -hmm. I think it's like a good, is a good way to, to yeah. think through. See, I'm children's rock, you know, so I'm the, mm, yeah. you know, that children's and YA specialist. So I, I think of the coming of age books and I think of Wild Seed as a very side strange, but still coming of age um, because of the fact that, you know, it's 13, you know, and you, you, you see who gets destroyed, uh, how Doro destroys some, mm -hmm. you know, um, and he's very destructive, which is very painful. Just you like know, fully, full on destruction. Oh my gosh. And, you know, he destroys so many um, just because, or being vengeful. He's just vengeful. You know, he, he'll do it just to, to hurt her, you know? Um, so it's still that coming of age. It's still that coming to maturity and then knowing what your, your, your almost like your superpowers, right? What your superpowers yeah. are. And you can't quite know what they are and how they manifest and it is interesting how both of them like return like doro he keeps returning to his trauma because he's like mm -hmm. i didn't know i didn't know anyone like me and so this was me surviving and then you're like but now you're you're here you're here but i could kill you doing this right yeah, yeah. and then right and you know her power is that like her body remains the same like once she transitions yes Right. She can change it, but she can always go back to, she exactly. can always go back to her 13 year old exactly. happy self. Yes. And, and see what age is that? See, we're, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I have a thing about it becoming, because there are rumors of them having a series, a television oh, series. Oh, yeah. They're, yeah. And I, you know, it hurts me because it's like, one, I don't want it to be real people. I want it, if it's going to, if you're going to do it, you're going to have to do top notch animation. Oh yeah, that would be good. Because I don't want I don't want actors messing this up. Mm. You know I mean, I mean? It'll be like yeah, it's kind of hard. I guess it could be really like CGI or something, right? Because there's a know. scene where she's like, "Let me eat this dolphin and turn my arm into a flipper." <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> wow, like, just hang it out. You know, but yeah. I just can't see it being. Um, I don't want the actors. I don't want them. Messing I don't know. This up. I don't know. Well, I don't know if we'll get it. I think, right. I, I just think this is the most this beautiful. This is right. like one of my favorite, favorite books. My book is really, you can tell I've lived it. I mean, the pages are, you know, the, there's writing all over, different ink and a whole bit. And I just, 
just feel like this is not one for the movies. When they said it was going to be a series, I went, oh, really? You know. I mean, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think there are a couple of good writers on it. So maybe. Okay. Nadia, I think I think Nadia Korafor is oh, on the project. Maybe? I think so. You're right. And that kind of gave me hope. I was like, oh, well, you know what's going on. Like, mm-hmm. At least you know what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't let the stars get in your eyes. That's what I want to tell her. Don't let them shine. And, and just because you're doing this, uh-uh, you know, so I don't know. Anything else? This has been wonderful. I, I, I'm i so glad I've had this Zoom conversation with you. <laughs> yeah, it's been really fun. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else have any questions? More, any questions or uh, comments? Everyone's thanking you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for calling, everyone. Uh, This was wonderful. Well, we'll have another one soon.